From dear Portugal gang to the Bime, this is why I stand with Israel in the Israel versus Palestine conflict and why I believe that the attention that's given to this conflict is rooted in anti-Semitism. Let's check it out. He's good, he's good, he's good, he's good. All right, before we get started, I noticed that many of you who enjoy my content still haven't gotten around to subscribing. It costs you nothing to subscribe, but it really, really helps me out. So go ahead and smash that subscribe button. Go on, smash it. And if you don't, that's ignorant. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so to begin with, uh, the other night we were on a, I was on a podcast with my good friend uh, Carl Munson doing the Munson and the Geezer. Um, once a week podcast that we do on Tuesday evening, Tuesday evening in Portugal, that is. And um, Carl had uh, Carl, Carl had, had shared a video um, with me. Let me just share that with you now. All right. Hopefully we can see this video. This, uh, this, this, this video is um, about how many wars there are in the world at the moment. How Let many me just wars do you think are happening? Show right? that to you quickly. Let's count them. Ukraine, Gaza. Mm -hmm. Are there any more? Well, there are more than 40 countries involved in war today. In right. So I won't carry on. This was a post that he'd found on X and it mentioned that there are over 40 uh, wars of various sizes going on in the world today. But of course, we are um, our media, our media and um, for various other reasons, our attention is kind of focused on the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine and the war between uh, Israel and Palestine. And as always, I would, um, or so, let's, say, let's say Gaza, however you want to put it, it doesn't matter. The point is, for some reason, our attentions are being focused on these two wars, okay? But there's about, it might just surprise you to learn that there are over 40 conflicts in the world happening right now. Uh, some of them are just as serious as the two that we're forced to pay attention to, or that our attention is... Um, constantly drawn to why is that but anyway it reminded me um of a thought that i've had and i'll just share another screen with you now and see what you th think of this one okay so now we're looking at a um a, i guess it's a kind of a meme that i shared on facebook and um why have i why have i shared this so let's have a look at um just some examples of genuine um Muslim or Islam or in the Islamic world um, genocides. And these are genuine genocides, okay? So Assad, Assad killing half a million Muslims in Syria, uh, 230,000 killed in Yemen, 24,000 Muslims massacred in Myanmar, and then Israel defends itself against Hamas. Now, I'm, go I'm happy to admit there's a kind of emotive word in there, defends itself. I know some people don't see it that way. But what my point is, is that, Many, many more Muslims are killed by other Muslims, um, you know, on a daily basis around the world. And Muslims in the UK say nothing. There, there's nothing. We don't hear anything from them. Or if we do, it's certainly not very loud. The only difference um, in this particular war is that this is Israel doing it. And that's why. And I want to start by saying that I'm not saying that everybody who is pro-Palestine is an anti-Semite. But what I am arguing, um, and I believe this 100%, there's really no point coming at me. I believe that the uh, the uh, feigned outrage is really um, rooted in anti-Semitism and um, the simple fact that um, Muslims and the Islamic world want all Jews dead and they want Israel not to exist and they want all Jews out of the Middle East. Um, and that's it. And, and for me, a big shocking thing that I see um, these days is people in Western Europe openly walking down the streets shouting anti-Semitic uh, slogans, even carrying Nazi flags. It's just uh, absolutely unbelievable to me. And, um, you know, it, it's it's a massive problem. I don't know what the solution will be. I think that perhaps, um, unfortunately, you know, we've let the monster in through the gates and uh, I don't really see how we can shut it now. Um, now that I live in Portugal, I just hope that my Portuguese brethren uh, pay attention um, to what's happening in other parts of Europe and act accordingly. So um, occasionally people have said that they think I'm quite articulate and I don't think I'm particularly articulate. 
And um, but part of um, I think um, <laughs> being someone who's got any kind of brain is recognizing that about yourself and turning to uh, experts um, who are more articulate than you um, to help you uh, gather your thoughts and describe what you think is really happening. And uh, I'm just going to share another screen with you guys. So let me just uh, let me just do that. Okay, let me just check that sharing. Yes, it is. Okay, so who I'm showing you here is um, this is uh, Constantine Kisson, and he um, is one of the hosts of a very good podcast that I really like called Trigonometry. And um, yeah, so just briefly to uh, introduce you to Konstantin Kisson. He's a Russian-British comedian, writer, and social commentator. Uh, he's born on December 25th, 1982 in Moscow. He moved to the UK at the age of 13. Kisson's diverse heritage includes Russian, Greek, and Jewish roots. Uh, his experiences growing up in the Soviet Union have significantly influenced his political perspectives. In addition to his comedy career, he has contributed to various British and American television and radio programs, including Question Time, Good Morning Britain, and BBC Breakfast. And before anyone has, before anyone anchors onto his you know Jewish roots and says, "Oh well, he would be pro-Israel, wouldn't he?" Um, I could just as easily, couldn't I say, well, you don't have any Jewish roots, so you would be pro-Palestine, wouldn't you? Or I could say, why are you um, asking me to pay attention to this particular Jewish person who is also pro-Palestine? You could go on and on and on and on. It's irrelevant, okay? And I'm going to show you why in this video. In fact, Kisson's going to explain uh, exactly why these types of things should be kept separate um, when you're debating about a topic like this, okay? So let's keep going. So in April 2018, Kisson co-founded Trigonometry, a YouTube channel and podcast with fellow comedian Francis Foster. Uh, the show is dedicated to open discussions on topics such as free speech, politics and culture, featuring a wide range of guests, including former presidential advisors, leading economic Ec leading economists, psychologists, journalists, and social commentators. Trigonometry has been recognized for its candid uh, conversations and was listed among the best 20 es escapist podcasts by the Daily Telegraph in 2020. Kisson is also the author of An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West, where he reflects on his experiences and offers insights into Western society. And yeah, Trigonometry is a podcast I can thoroughly recommend. They have all sorts of guests from all sides of politics. Um, and uh, generally speaking, they really, really maintain their neutrality and let their guests speak. Very, very good podcast, something I often listen to when I'm doing my long walks and runs in the mornings. I guess before anyone talks about bias, he really stayed off this topic uh, for quite a long time. And I had hoped that he would um, weigh in on it, but um, it seemed like quite a long time um, before um, Constantine Kisson finally um, weighed in on the um what happened since uh, was October 6th last year. Um, and this is only, I think, a few weeks ago that he made this video, maybe a month ago, something like that. So he really kind of stayed off the topic and stayed quite neutral and on the fence. And this is a video he made called I'm Off the Fence. And this pretty much um, explains the other reasons why I am on the side of Palestine. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to play this video and do this kind of um, talk over that a lot of YouTubers do. What I've done is I've just kind of condensed it into uh, hopefully it's going to be less than about 10 minutes because uh, I know everyone's got TikTok brain these days. No one wants to watch one hour podcast. I actually did watch the whole podcast, but I'm not expecting anyone else to. This is just for me just to narrow down why I am standing with Israel and why I think you should too and why I think it's rooted in anti Semitism. So, anyway. Um, this is his video, Why I'm Off the Fence About Israel's Law. I'll put the link in the show notes. Can't recommend it enough. And seriously, if you've been struggling to make sense of the Israel-Hamas conflict while dodging the endless stream of bad takes, this video is really like stepping into a room with the adults of the conversation. Um, so, you know, let's start with a bit of context. In the video, Kissin admits that until recently... Um, he didn't have much of an opinion about the Israeli-Palestine conflict. He hadn't visited Israel, Gaza or the West Bank. He hadn't studied uh, the region at university. In fact, he stayed quiet for a long time after the October 7th attacks. Sorry, October 7th, not October 6th. Choosing instead to listen, read and absorb perspectives from across the spectrum. 
Uh, here's what really impressed me. Instead of blindly parroting one side or the other, Kissin used what he calls first principle uh first principle thinking to strip the arguments down to their core no appeals to emotion uh, in a um no hand wringing just cold hard logic and let's be honest in a debate as emotionally charged as this one that approach is like a breath of fresh air i'm sure you'll agree uh now kissen dives into what he calls the four principal arguments from the anti-israel camp uh let me walk you through them and why they fall apart under scrutiny Okay, so uh, argument number one, Israel is illegitimate, an argument I'm sure we've all heard before. This one is a classic, isn't it? The claim is that Israel was created by Western powers who displaced Palestinians, turning the land over to European Jews fleeing the Holocaust. Palestinians didn't consent, so poof, Israel's very existence is invalid. Sounds compelling, right? Wrong. Kisson points out the obvious flaw here. Uh, by that logic, almost every country in the world would be illegitimate. The United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, all products of invasion, colonization and displacement. Yet no one seriously suggests we dismantle those countries. And then there's the little matter of reality. Israel exists. It's home to over nine million people. The idea that they'd or should just pack up and leave is absurd. No country would tolerate missiles and terrorist attacks from its neighbors. And Israel is no exception. Argument number two, October 7th was a response to Israeli oppression. Ah, that they were driven to it, defense. This one really gets under my skin. Now, Kissin doesn't dismiss the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza or the West Bank. Far from it, and neither do I. But uh, he makes a crucial distinction. The October 7th attacks weren't a military operation targeting Israel's government or military. They were a massacre designed to terrorize civilians. And that's the difference. And if you can't see that, I really don't understand what is going on in your head. Think about it. If Hamas had attacked an Israeli military base, we could at least frame it as an act of resistance. But that's not what happened. Instead, Hamas militants stormed civilian areas, slaughtering men, women and children and taking hostages. It wasn't about liberation. It was about inflicting maximum pain. And here's where Kissin delivers one of the most chilling comparisons. On a proportional basis, October 7th was 12 times worse than 9-11. Imagine thousands of armed fighters crossing the U.S. border, killing 36,000 people and kidnapping thousands more. Would there still be a Mexico? Yeah, probably not, right? Argument three, Israel is killing civilians. This is the one anti-Israel argument that's undeniably true. Yes, civilians are dying. But as Kissam points out, that's only half the story. In war, civilians always die. The real question is, who's responsible and who can stop the killing? Let's talk numbers. Urban warfare usually results in about nine civilian deaths for every one combatant killed. In Gaza, that ratio is two to one. Despite Hamas using civilians as human shields and deliberately maximizing casualties, Israel's precision is actually extraordinary. And then there's Hamas itself. They built an extensive network of tunnels to protect their fighters, yet they refuse to build bomb shelters for their own civilians. In fact, they've openly encouraged people to confront Israeli airstrikes with their bare chests. Why? Because dead civilians are useful for propaganda. It's grotesque. And Kissin doesn't hold back in calling it out. Argument number four, Israel's attacks are indiscriminate. This is where Kissin really brings the receipts. He highlights Operation Grim Reaper, where Israel targeted a batch of senior Hezbollah operatives with surgical precision. Thousands of targets were hit, yet civilian casualties were minimal. Compare that to other urban conflicts in history, and Israel's approach stands out as one of the most restrained and calculated we've ever seen. Yet critics still scream indiscriminate. Honestly, it's like complaining that a surgeon didn't apologize to the scalpel. The bigger picture. Kissin wraps up by addressing the broader issue. Israel isn't just fighting Hamas. It's also battling a wave of Western apologists who twist facts and peddle moral relativism. And here's the kicker. If any other country were in Israel's position, they'd respond the same way. The only difference is they'd have the world support. So why doesn't Israel get that support? 
because they dare to defend themselves and because narratives like these crafted to pull at your heartstrings are designed to obscure the harsh realities of this conflict. Why this matters? Here's why I think Kissin's video is so important. It cuts through the noise. It's not just about picking sides. It's about understanding the facts and rejecting the manipulative tactics used to demonize Israel. So if you're tired of the same old arguments or want a clear logical breakdown of the conflict, do yourself a favor and watch the video. It's 40 minutes of brutal honesty that'll leave you questioning everything you thought you knew. And if you've already seen it, let's talk. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Are you on the fence, off it, or just building a stronger one? I just want to add one more thing. We keep getting told just how many civilian casualties there are in, in Gaza on a daily basis. Dead women, dead children, we're told again and again, every day, thousands and thousands. So why is it that X is full of fake images of dead people? Why do we see videos of corpses that suddenly sit up? Why do we see, uh, go, you can Google this for yourself or go onto X and do, do a search for FAFO man. Why is there this method actor who's one minute he's pretending to be a surgeon, the one minute he's pretending to be a father carrying a baby, the next minute he's a, a, um, a journalist, the next minute he's a dead man. If these deaths are happening all the time in Gaza, every single day, why do we need actors playing the part? Why is there so much fake propaganda coming out of Gaza? Surely there should be enough content um, if we're to believe the lies that are being told by uh, Hamas and its agents. Also, why are we believing terrorists? Think about it. Anyway, I'm sure this is going to be uh, controversial and another one in my long list of videos where I'm going to get uh, where I'm going to lose a lot of subscribers. As I say, I speak my truth. I think I'm going to wrap the video up here. Um, please argue it out in the comments, as you always do. But please, as always, be respectful. We're not changing anything. Nothing here is going to make anything change. We're just sharing our opinions, okay? That's all that's happening. <laughs> if you like this type of content and you're new around here, please consider subscribing. And if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Muito obrigado, amigos. Ciao.